وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in chapter 33 Al-Ahzab verse 33 إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ الرُّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Inshallah the verse in question in reference to the topic for tonight we'll be discussing is the concept and the faculty of infallibility and this is a of the utmost importance, especially within the school of thought, which is Ahlul Bayt. Now, as we know, this specific aspect that the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt believes in, whereas other schools of thought that do not. One of which is Adala, that Allah is just in all that He does. Another is Imamat, that we believe that after the Prophet of Islam, there are people to safeguard the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we believe that is one of the pillars of our religion. And another aspect in which we believe in, and other schools of thought do not, is the aspect of infallibility. Whereas we come forth with the idea stating that no matter any of Allah's representatives of earth, whether they'd be an imam or a prophet appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe there is an aspect of infallibility that goes hand in hand with them being a messenger or a protector of a message sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now first idea is that we want to look at is the idea and concept of being a role model. The second of which we want to look at the aspect within the Holy Quran of how is it that we can prove there is an idea which is infallibility. What different uh, Quranic verses can we find that will prove the idea and the concept of infallibility to our Imams and our Prophets? And on the third level, let's look at logical explanations in which we can elaborate on the aspect of in infallibility so that we may get a more close and heartfelt understanding of the level of these individuals. So inshallah, to start the topic off for tonight, please help me in reciting a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The aspect of role models is that one of the most important, especially in a Western society, and especially in the 21st century. And a question may be raised as to why is there so much significance on the aspect of role models. Now the first significance someone might come and ask is that if I follow in the footstep of someone, let's say for example, and I've given this example many aspects, if we were to look at and look at our youth, the first question when we look up and tell them, who do you look up to? When we say to our youth, who do you look up to? The main answers that we get back are particular soccer superstars, such as Ronaldo and Messi. When you look at an actual fact, they follow them in such a level that they know week in, week out what's happening, whether they be injured, how long their injury is going to be for, who they have next in fixtures to play. And I see many smiles in the crowd saying, yes, that's us. But the reality is that when we have role models as such, that we look up to, yes, they may be very amazing sportsmen. However, we've come to a level in which not only do we take the amazing aspect of their sportsmanship or their particular, let's say, skills within that particular sport and their high-ranking abilities, we've also tried to take anything else that they do within our lives. Whereas many people would look at Ronaldo and let's say Messi as an example and say that they live lives in such a manner. So it's okay for me to have such and such lifestyle. They go towards such and such areas. It's okay for me because they're my role model to go to such and such areas. Where the, reali the reality is that these areas that people are going towards and these aspects that people are listening to and following in their footsteps may be that which the Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman will look down upon. And that's where the danger lies. And I'm giving this as an example of soccer superstars. However, many other aspects come into place. And that's why the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt 
try to instill the idea that makes sure that you handpick your role models very carefully. Because, and this is the difference, when we believe in infallibility, this is the main reason we believe in infallibility, or one of the main reasons, is that if we follow someone that's imperfect, we have the idea in the back of our mind, we're following someone that's imperfect in the first place. Why is it that I have to be of the utmost perfection myself? And that's why we raise the question when other schools of thought believe that the prophets or the prophets that preceded our holy prophet وسلم, were infallible. They have the idea saying that yes, they made mistakes. The school of thought of Islam comes and says, no, how can a leader that Allah has hand chosen have any mistakes? And that's something we need to look at, inshallah, during the duration of this lecture to, to say and to analyze how we can prove the infallibility of our messengers and our imams. So the first that we want to look at, because we've listened to the importance of choosing role models carefully. Other people, they've lowered the rank of the Prophet of Islam to elevate other people in history. But we're not going to get into that topic tonight, inshallah. It's a topic for the later nights in Muharram, that we're going to look at it in more depth, insha'Allah. But tonight, the first verse that I've chosen, and that's the verse in question, is the main aspect and the pivotal location of this particular dialogue. But before it, I want to go to the origin of history. When Iblis talks, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Iblis, bow down to Adam, there's a verse that comes into question. Uh, chapter 38 and the verse is 83 when we look at the context when which shaitan talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put this in the brackets in the back of our minds he says and look at the eloquence of the Arabic grammar here to tell you the difference between two separate entities by differentiating them with a fatha or a kasra that's how significant and precise the language is, the Arabic language. One fatha can refer to an entirely different aspect of people. A kasra associates them with someone totally different. Shaitan, when he talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I will divert. When he tells them, let, let me go and try to divert all of Bani Adam. He says, let me. He says, I will divert each and every individual that you've created, except, and this is the word that he uses, al-mukhlasin. People might say mukhlas, we look at it nowadays. A mukhlas, if we want to look at it, in our modern day, is someone that's sincere in his actions. That's with a kasra. If you say mukhlas, it means someone that has sincerity to that which he does, an action that he does, or something that he preaches, he's sincere in that which he does. When a fatha comes into question, and look at any translation, it says the people that Allah has handpicked. Mukhlas means divinely guarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Iblis is saying what? On the first level, before we had anything to do with, let's say, religion, prophets after prophets after prophets, Iblis knew back then in the creation of Adam, he says, I will divert all of them from your path, except the ones that are divinely guarded. And that's hand in hand. That's the concept itself of infallibility. Because someone may come and ask the question, hold on. We're following these people. Yes, they are prophets. Yes, they are our imams. At the end of the day, are they human? Are they not human? We say, yes, they're human without a shadow of doubt. He says, but they're infallible. Whenever we say a story about Imam Ali alayhi afdal salati wasalam, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam, or anyone that we say a story about that's an infallible, the first argument that comes up, well, they're infallible, say you. They're, they're where, I'm where, what are you trying to compare me with? Well, the reality is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't choose an angel to be a messenger. He chose a human to tell you that you can achieve this rank. You can't achieve prophethood, but in a, mor in a moral stance, in an ethical perspective, in a religious viewpoint, you can reach that perfection. And we look at people that went to these perfection levels, that weren't prophets, weren't imams, but followed in the footsteps of the imams, and they achieved that morality. They achieved that religiosity. They achieved the height of ethics 
by following in their footsteps. And that's why we have the examples that we do from the Holy Quran and the teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Zain al Abidin, a person comes to him and he says the same question that we raise. You're infallible. You can't sin. Why do we follow you? He says, no, 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 no. You've got the entire context of infallibility wrong. He says, how? Explain it to me. He says, it's not that we cannot sin. We can. We're humans as well. The same things that you might find pleasure in, we may find pleasure in. The same things that you might sin in, we're accustomed, we can. He says, then what's the difference? He says, we won't. He says, explain to me further. I don't understand. So he gives him a beautiful explanation. He says, can you or can you not go out in the streets unclothed, naked as we say? Can you or can't you? And the man says, well, of course I can. It's not that hard. You take off your clothes, you go out in the street. Then he raises the question, but would you? He says, no, I wouldn't. I have something that's called shame, embarrassment. What are the people going to say? What kind of negative aspects will it have? What kind of backlash will it have on my reputation? Why would I do such a thing? Imam replies by saying, well, we know what we are doing, our actions and their positive and negative outcomes. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that this is halal, this is haram, this is makruh, mustahab, we know why. Because of the knowledge that we have been given. The deciphering of the Holy Quran, knowing why this is and why this isn't. And that's a level in which we don't even look at, we don't have to look at the infallibles to reach. When we look at the companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib that have that rank, when we look at Salman al Muhammadi having that rank, Malik al Ashtar having that rank, Maqdad, Abadar, they had these ranks in which they can decipher. Knowing why this is good, why this is bad. How can it have a negative incantation on one's soul, on one's spirituality, on one's ethics and morality? Therefore they stay away from that which may displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end of the day, if we look at it at a basic level, it's not harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor is it gaining him any reward. At the end of the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says stay away from A and go towards B, it's for our own salvation. When you stay, stay away from haram because it has a negative impact. Whether we see that negative impact or we do not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. He is the creator. Whether we pray or don't pray, it doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It affects us in the long run. We need salvation. Allah doesn't need our worship. We want to be of the people that will be raised to assist Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman And when Allah has given us this pathway to follow, how many of us actually tread on the exact same footsteps as our Imams teach us? That's what we need to gain from Muharram this year. Infallibility. Number two, the aspect I want you want to talk about is when we look at Hadith al-Kisa. And we've got to remember Hadith al-Kisa is not only mentioned in our articles, not just mentioned in our books. It's more so mentioned in the brothers' books rather than ours, in a numerical value. When we have other people narrating that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has the Kisa al-Yamani, and he puts under it that which he has chosen, Fatima, as, the, as the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells to Jibra'il when he asks him, who is under the kisa? He says, Hum Fatima wa abiha wa ba'liha wa baniha. Sallu ala Muhammad. And that's when we read in Hadith al-Kisa, Jibra'il comes down with a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does he say? He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salams. And then he begins to mention one after the other of what he would not have created if it was not for you five that are under, under the kisa. Then he says the verse in question. 
إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا Allah wants, look at the aspect, Allah wants to remove all impurities and purify you a thorough purification. Allah's guarding you. Allah's handpicked you for His message. Allah has chosen you as a representative and a role model that best goes hand in hand with His message. When we look at infallibility, that's when we look at, and that's the irony, when we look at the du'as of our imams, and we find that the imams, time and time again, they have istighfar, istighfar, istighfar. We read du'a Kumail. We read du'a Abu Hamza Thumali. Look at the humbleness of the words of the imams. Some people raise the question, why do they keep saying astaghfirullah? The Prophet was on his tippy toes, as we like to say. Saying astaghfirullah every night. And his wife comes to him and she asks him, Why is it? Do you have any sins? She goes, No. But shall I not be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Other narration come forth and state that saying astaghfirullah is not saying that I am apologizing for that which I have done. No. On the contrary, it's saying that, Oh Allah, I want you to safeguard me from any sins that I will be committing. A source of protection. When you say astaghfirullah, it's a source of protection. When the imams would say astaghfirullah and teach that to us, is to tell us that yes, you can have a small rank or an idea of this infallibility, being guarded from sinning. There's aspect that we can do that we may have been overlooking. When we find, when looking at salah, we find a narration that comes and states, it safeguards you from that which is impure. Therefore, there is an aspect of infallibility there, meaning guarded from that which is impure. So there are many ranks that we can look at in infallibility. But the idea is that we want to actually prove it to first and foremost ourselves, that we can defend it in the aspect saying that the prophets were infallible, the imams were infallible. So on the first level, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He does not talk of his own accord. Rather, he says that which Allah has granted to him to say. Now, everything the Prophet does is perfection. Let's look at this aspect because it's very, very important and many of us have overlooked this aspect. The Prophet, not only is his vocals perfection, not only is what he says from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not his own accord. But every movement that he does is also perfection. How? The Prophet, and I've said this on many events, but look at the perfection of the movements of the Prophet of Islam. He has a narration in which he says, and he mentions he uses these two fingers. Let's look at these. He doesn't use any other fingers, he uses these two fingers. He says, Ana wa kafilul yatim kahatan. He says, me and the person that sponsors an orphan are like these two in paradise. If you look at these two fingers, one is longer than the other, isn't it? One is at a different position than the other. So saying that, yes, they'll be in heaven. They might be, might be my neighbors. They don't have the same rank. There's differences between these two fingers. Therefore, there's differences between me and the person that sponsors an orphan. But we are close, nonetheless. How does he look at the Ahlul Bayt in the aspect of infallibility? When he mentions the Ahlul Bayt on many occasions, he uses these two fingers. The same fingers on either hand. Meaning that just like this finger is the reflection of this finger. When he mentions, make sure you hold on to two weighty things. The Qur'an and my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt. And he puts these two fingers together, meaning what? Meaning just like the Qur'an doesn't have any faults and is guarded. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are the ones 
that have brought this message and we protect it in the Holy Quran. Just like that, when we look at the reflection of the Quran, when the Prophet says these two, hold on to these two, mirror images, reflections, the exact same, it means that just like the Quran is infallible, that the Ahlul Bayt are also divinely guarded and infallible. And I think that needs a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So the ad idea of infallibility. Let's look at it from a logical perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a perfect omnipotent being. He sends the Quran, which is his book, a perfect book. So we have Allah perfection, the book that he reveals, also perfection. Now the means in which he chooses to reveal this book, if it has a fault, if the Prophet of Islam has a fault, if any messenger has a fault, can you imagine when the Prophet comes and says, you know what, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not lie. But if the Prophet is not perfect and he lies, does it does not make the Prophet well, a hypocrite? If he says, don't lie and he lies. Don't steal and he steals. Don't do such and such bad act. He goes and does it. Therefore, it's illogical to think outside the parameters in which saying that the Quran that is being taught by the Prophet, the application taught by the Prophet, that the Prophet himself is fallible, makes mistakes. Why? Because it would make him a hypocrite, doesn't it? And it's saying that Allah doesn't know how to choose his messengers, doesn't it? Therefore, if Allah has chosen this person to be our role model and he's imperfect, how do we strive to become perfect? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the tongue of the Prophet says, I have been brought and I have been revealed to perfect the mannerisms of mankind. Because he's the height of mannerisms, the height of morality. And many people are attributed within history to achieve great ranks. Without a doubt, we as the followers of Ahlul Bayt are to achieve high ranks. When Abu Dhar goes towards the Prophet of Islam and he asks him, and this is the question we have to ask ourselves first and foremost, he goes, why is it that there are ranks amongst the Sahaba? Why? Why is Salman known as Salman al-Muhammadi? Because you've attributed him to yourself. Salman al-Minna Ahlul Bayt. Doesn't he say that? How is it that you can reach this rank? Other people you don't look at in history because they have, I don't know if you want to call it the, the rubbish of history, but other people, let's see how they acted towards the prophets and how Salman al Muhammad will act. So the Prophet of Islam tells Abu Dhar, he says, go outside and you will see exactly how to achieve that particular rank. So he goes outside. He sees Ali ibn Abi Talib walking. And after he's walking, Salam alaikum as he walks past. Behind him, Salman al Muhammad is walking, very little bit awkwardly. As Ali ibn Abi Talib passes Abu Dhar, he sees Salman. Salam alaikum as He looks at him swaying. He says, What are you doing, Salman? Look at the beauty that we need to learn from Salman al Muhammadi and apply it to our lives. Look at the beauty. Salman says, Look at the floor. He looks. He says, what do you see? He says, I see footprints of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, what do you think I'm doing? He says, I'm not sure. He says, you see wherever Ali puts his left foot? He says, yes. He says, I want to put my left foot. He says, where you see Ali put his right foot? He says, yes. He says, I want to make sure I want to put my right foot. Gives us a lesson that's saying what? If you want to achieve the rank of Salman, you want to do as Salman does. When Salman says to us and teaches us that the only way you can follow the Ahlul Bayt is to follow their teachings and in their footsteps, wherever they place their left, you place your left. Wherever they say place your right foot, you press your right foot. And that's why when we find that they're infallible, it's not like trying to question that which someone 
says other than the infallible, having something that doesn't sound quite right. When the infallibles come forth with a statement, it's eloquence upon eloquence. Go and open Nahj al -Balagha. Go and look at the ahadith of our prophets. Go and read the dua. That's the one aspect that differentiates our school of thought. Read the dua. Look at the words of the imams when talking towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Humbleness. Upon humbleness. Upon humbleness. These are people that have never even thought about going against Allah. Not even thought about a sin that they want to commit, ever. That's our role models. And we challenge every nation and every religion to bring forth any example like that that we have. Any other religion will say that their prophets are fallible. They attribute particular aspects of sins towards their prophets. Go open their books. But we say no, we have the best role models because they are infallible. They have never done a mistake. And they're handpicked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, taking this into account, there is a certain rank that we can achieve. Yes. Can someone achieve that rank and go down? Also yes. How? We have an example by the person by the name of Barsisat. Famous name. Jewish rabbi. This person was attributed saying as soon as he would make a dua, Allah would grant him that dua. How is it that this person, high ranking, came down? Let's have a look. Because the whispers of shaitan are intense and there's no one there to help you on the right path. Let's see what happens. And we're going to talk about the whispering and jinn in two nights inshallah on Sunday. And when you discover it in a more of a deep aspect, insha'Allah. Barsisat, once there was a king. The princess fell sick. So they found left, right and center, no one could cure her. They told the king that there's a particular rabbi that his dua is mustajab. Whenever he raises his hands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him that which he wishes. So he takes her. Two brothers take that girl, which was a princess, towards the rabbi. Can you cure her? He says, leave me. I don't want anything to do with the king. He says, no, 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 we'll pay you a grand sum. He says, not a problem. Let me just make dua and you can take it. No, 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 leave her overnight. He says, not a problem. He makes dua. After he makes dua, wa alaikum salam After he makes dua, she's cured. Brothers are not there. She's still there. Shaitan comes. You're a high-ranking person. People look up to you. It is a beautiful girl. Allah gives us the example of Zulaikha in the Quran and how Yusuf overcame it. So Barsisat, he's, he's the whispers, whispers, whispers of Shaitan. And Shaitan tells him, you know what? You're a high-ranking scholar. No one will believe her even if she says anything against you. And he commits an atrocious act. Let's leave it at that. Then the shaitan comes again. But when you start, when the, why does the Quran say, shaitan"? Do not fall or do not follow the footsteps of Satan, however small it may be or however big. Do not follow them. Why? Because one will lead to another until it becomes an avalanche. Now you've committed the sin. What's going to happen when she tells her brothers? You have to kill her. So he's thinking to himself, all right, I've got to kill this person. He goes and kills her. Shaitan comes again. What do I do now, Shaitan? He's saying to him, well, you have to bury her. You can't tell her that, well, I've killed your sister. So he buries her. What do I tell the brothers? Well, you have to lie one after another, one after another. So he realizes, I'm not sure. I cured her when the brothers came. He says, well, I cured her and she, she went. I'm not sure where she went. So days upon days, they're outside looking for this particular sister of theirs. Days upon days. Then the shaitan comes to them. Because shaitan doesn't want uh, someone to get away with something. So he comes. He says, you know what? I know that this person has killed your sister. And he's buried her in the back of that monastery. So they dig up the monastery. They find the bones of his sister. 
they take that person. A person in which had a high rank, in which Allah would allow his dua to be mustajab. Imagine what rank that would be, brothers and sisters. But how quick it can fall. He goes to the hangar. Khalas prosecuted. Life and death. Shaitan comes again. You think he leaves you alone? Shaitan comes again. He says, you know what, Barsisat? He says, what? He says, I'll take you out of this. I'll help you. He says, well, I have a rope hanging on my neck. How is it you're going to help me? He says, just bow to me. He says, I will divert them. All except Al-Mukhlasin. The divinely guarded. So he says, I can't bow. My head's on a rope. What do I do? He says, just with your eyelids. Lower them, that's a bow. He lowers his eyelids. The rope hangs him. And he says, that one's gone to hell. I've got one. Oh Allah. Giving us the example that's what? Does not matter how much we learn, brothers and sisters. Doesn't matter how much we know, how much we preach. And that's why I speak to myself first and foremost. Do not let a particular act give you arrogance. Shaitan prayed more than any of us, if not all of us combined. When we have a hadith saying 6,000 years. Narration says he, he, he prayed and prostrated to Allah. Others say that he prostrated one prostration for 6,000. Saying what? That make sure he prayed. Much, much more than any of us. One act lowered him down, which was arrogance. Make sure that however much that we follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt, it does not make us arrogant. It does not make us think that ourselves higher than we are. Look at the du'as of our imams. Look at how our imams supplicated, our infallible supplicated towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will know how we should look at ourselves and how we should talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the aspect of infallibility. Logically proven. Through the Quran, proven. And in a role model perspective, also proven. And there are many more if someone was to look deeper into the Quran. And deeper when the Prophet of Islam takes the hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib and says to the people, where, whomever I have is master, Ali is his master. To be a master that has more of an authority of someone than themselves. How much does he have to be divinely guarded? Let's think about that. And that's why when people question, and I end on this note, when people question how is it that Imam Hussein could do and perform that which he performed on the 10th of Muharram. Miracle after miracle. And when we look at miracles, it doesn't have to be something that is amazing in a matter that, you know what, you've split the moon. No, a miracle of etiquette. Miracle of a manner in which he reacted and acted and sacrificed. And when you look at that, you find yourself, there's no way any other person would be able to do that except that he knows that he was divinely guided. When Charles Dickens says about Imam Hussein, he says, if Hussein was chasing worldly means, then I am flabbergasted in the matter. That's why is it that he took with him and alongside him his woman and his children. Then he says, it only stands to reason. Then when Hussein went, he went solely to please his creator, which was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we learn more about how Imam Hussein acted on the 10th of Muharram, the salvation he gave towards his enemies, the aspect in which he was crying because they were going towards the hell because of his death, we begin to realize this is a person that had ethics, morality, knowledge, much higher than that of a normal human. Only of that, that a person that is divinely guarded, that knows Allah and what he has allowed to happen and wanted as a sacrifice. And we end on this note, brothers and sisters, and I've gone over time and I apologize. But inshallah, we've gained an aspect in which we can learn, number one, that there is a rank that we must achieve. There is a rank in which we will have to follow the footsteps to achieve. But let not that rank that we achieve lower us. 
with particular acts that corrupt the heart, such as arrogance. And inshallah, we pray to Allah that He allows us this particular rank and allows us or allows to show us that path in which we can follow. Barakatil Suratil Mubarakatil Fatiha, but before it, three of you allowed the salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.